Good afternoon and welcome back. Um, Moving Images is a partnership between um, the Sharjah Art Foundation, Art Dubai, and the Dubai International Film Festival. And this um, specially curated session, I would like to welcome Omar Khalaif and Joanna Haja Thomas that will look at the crossover between art and film. Thank you so much. Um, Hello. So, so uh, I was actually here last year where we had a very engaging and exciting conversation around crossovers between art and cinema, particularly thinking about the various modes of conceptualization, production and exhibition between the two fields of practice. And it's great to be able to be back in Dubai to continue that conversation here today. Um, we decided uh, to f actually this time do a very particular case study on the work of two artist filmmakers, Joanna Hajitoma and Khalil Juraij, one of which is here today, Joanna. Um, Joanna Hajitoma and Khalil Juraij are filmmakers and artists whose work are in collections from the Pompidou to the Guggenheim, and their feature films have been exhibited and seen internationally. Their first film, Around the Pink House, was a, their debut film in 1999, was a box office smash in Lebanon and in the region. Um, and they have gone on to produce a number of films, including A Perfect Day, starring Rabbi Amroui, Je veux voir, starring Catherine Deneuve, and most recently, The Lebanese Rocket Society. They are also the co-founders of Aboud Productions, based in Beirut, and also um, on the organizing and founding committee of the Metropolis Art Cinema in Beirut, and also on the curricular committee of the Home Workspace Program in Beirut. So they are artists and teachers who work across fields, and I guess what we're going to do today is take a kind of potted journey through their practice focusing on the conceptualization of particular projects and kind of really explore in some depth the production and exhibition context by which these projects emerged. And I suppose what we'll do is we will talk for about 45 minutes to 50 minutes and then open up to questions. So I hope that that's interesting. We'll show clips. We'll keep you entertained, I hope. So, Joanna, I think it, it, it's worth starting from the beginning about your background. So you and Khalil, who are not only partners in life and partners in art and cinema, um, didn't necessarily undergo a conventional um, film or art schooling necessarily, but as far as I've always understood it, the desire to produce work came from a particular kind of urgency. Maybe that's a good place to begin. Yes, we didn't uh, study art and films. Uh, we, uh, but we uh, grew up uh, during the civil wars in Lebanon, and in the 90s, uh, we began um, taking picture uh, of uh, the Midtown and uh, all Beirut uh, destructions, and um, trying to understand how you can keep a trace of all what uh, was left from the war, and knowing that uh, most part of it will be uh, destroyed to be rebuilt. So um, after that, we, we were like, uh, in a way, driven to do uh, photography, but also a film. And we were always very interested from the beginning in those two practices and the ways they can communicate together. Um, for us, there's no like a very uh, clear barrier or borders between them because we take research, something that is uh, very close to what we, we are going through or what we witness, and we just, it takes uh, different forms. And it was like that from the beginning. So uh, while we were doing those images in uh, Beirut, just after uh, the aftermath of the civil wars, we were thinking of a story and, and a film that would take part in those places and will tell uh, personal and uh, maybe fictional, but also a very documented story about the people that were there and about the uh, thematic of the reconstruction that was always uh, very important for us because we will always wanted to talk about our present and not only to go back to the past, but to be really rooted in our present and what we, we can do in this present. And can you tell me a little bit about how your first feature film Around the Pink House came about? Uh, around the Pink House it was a very strange experience because we were uh, preparing an exhibition uh, of uh, photography uh, at, uh, in Beirut and uh, at the same time in Paris. 
And um, we wrote stories for these uh, exhibitions, and then the stories took a kind of um, uh, scripted uh, way, and uh, finally it was a script, and we didn't uh, do any films before. Um, so uh, this script uh, happened to become a feature film because uh, we, we uh, met a producer. I believe a lot in meetings and encounters and all that. And so we met him in Beirut and um, we told him the story and finally the story, we had production and it's still today the film that we had most production around it was uh, this pink house. Um, and um, But at that moment we didn't do any films so it was, uh, our first experience was a feature film so it was very strange for us. But it turned out to be an incredible experience because we had like 23 actors and we really wanted to question uh, what we were living through and how you go from a period of war to a period of uh, peace in a way without considering that war is only something that you can put into brackets. This was something that we always wanted to talk around and to work around it because we didn't believe that and this was the urgency maybe that you were talking about at the beginning. We were we wanted to ask questions to our society and to ourselves and to discuss them. So this was the story of the Pink House at the beginning. And it's here where we first see the connection between what we were doing as, image, uh, for as photographers and uh, at film, because at that moment, we were working around uh, postcards, because we, we saw that a lot of postcards that were taken in the 60s and published at that time were still uh, everywhere. Like this were the postcards that you would take from uh, Beirut. And um, so we thought, like, why don't we try to put these postcards and to see how we can make them uh, more close to what it are the buildings look like today. And this was the first project that we did uh, that was called the Wonder Beirut Project, where we took some postcards and we invented kind of fictional f uh, characters that is taken in a way from films that Abdullah Farah to burn those postcards little bit uh, and uh, progressively during the civil wars. Should we show a clip? And this project we used at the beginning <laughs> for the credits of the <laughs> So the images that you see in the credit sequence are these postcards, which were also an artwork called Wonder Beirut, um, which are a series that have been exhibited as photographs in various different contexts and exhibitions. Could you tell us a little bit about this particular relationship in so much as thinking about the production process, the, these images, how they existed in relation to the film? So the images came first, 
that's my understanding. And then you use them within the actual, the, the film itself. But then the images, how did that affect the life of the actual project afterwards, the art project? In this specific case, it didn't really affect the project, uh, like we will see in other projects. But uh, what was interesting for us, it was that it was the first uh, moment, uh, first uh, where we thought about mixing both because uh, it was so related. Uh, and while we were, in a way, burning this photograph, pretending to be Abdullah Farah, we were, in a way, uh, saying a story. Because we told, uh, we, we this project is called Wonder Beirut, the story of a pyromaniac photograph, photographer. And so, in a way, there was this um, going back and forth from films to art. And so, we wa really wanted very clearly to put this credit at the beginning as a statement. Like, we are artists and filmmakers, this is our research, and this is the way we work. And in if you have seen the, the uh, Pink House, there's a lot of places where there are a lot of hints for uh, artwork. For example, one of the characters takes one image every day and make a kind of uh, installation. Another one uh, do a, two, a set up with all the bullets that are in the house. So we were like uh, playing with that idea. And this you mentioned, the story of the film, maybe we could tell us a little bit about the story of the film, and because I'm curious, did the story, the story of the film emerged from this, this postcard research, or, did or was it that they were separate experiences? Um, it was a research uh, that we did at that time because uh, we were thinking like how we're gonna uh, go through that period and uh, it was very strange because if you listen to the noise in the city we had all this uh, bullets and uh, you know all, uh, all the conflicts uh, armed conflict happening and finally there was a very brief moment of silence and we begin rebuilding and uh, all this reconstruction project. And people would say like, Halas, we have to stop talking about the war and we have to go uh, on, we have to continue, it's very important. And we thought that it's, it was very important to, uh, to go through a reconstruction project, but at the same time, uh, there was a kind of uh, amnesic uh, amnesia going all over and we were very afraid of it. Like we were s sure that wa the war, uh, the Beirut war didn't really begin, uh, the Lebanese war, sorry, in 75 and, and in 90s. But as we say, we see today, it's there was a lot of reasons that made us uh, fight against each other. So this was a way to put the Lebanese civil war in those ideal images. Um, because the story of the Pink House is the story of two families uh, that took refugee, that are refugee from uh, the mountain and that uh, just uh, were displaced. And uh, there was a pink house, a big house that was empty, and they just lived like a lot of people in Lebanon at that time. And uh, but it's a time of reconstruction, and someone has uh, just have the, um, uh, want to rebuild the house and to make it like a commercial center. But he wants to keep the facade. So of course, there's a lot of this notion of keeping uh, the postcards, uh, keeping this idea, the nostalgic idea, uh, to those moments where we wanted more to think about. And now, how do we get out those nostalgic images and we begin working with? what we have today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can show another clip, we turn off the light. So this particular film um, preceded um, another... This is an image, yes, of another film. And Could you you mentioned that that film was also your biggest production budget and your um, and also most commercially successful film, but then you decided to take a different track and to work with different a different project, um, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about a perfect day and the process around this and how it evolved from the first film. Just to have uh, very quick words on the production of uh, the Pink House, so we had like. Um, a budget uh, that was uh, around a million dollars. 
And at that time, it was a good budget for a film. But we had a lot of uh, things, the co-production with France, uh, co-production with uh, uh, Quebec, and it was uh, really hard to deal with all those co-production. French wanted us to speak uh, uh, half of the film should be recorded and uh, shot while the actors would speak French. That was really a nightmare. And uh, because, of course, uh, that's not their language, and it's, it would sound so terrible in the film. So we, and and uh, we had to do all the post-production in Quebec. So we were totally traumatized by this experience. And we thought, Khalas, it's not for us money, production, co-production. We will do very short films with the budgets, or we will do feature films with very small budgets. But we will do be totally free. And we opened, at that moment, our boot production. Uh, that is uh, now uh, run by Georges Schuker in Beirut because we thought like maybe we are not typically traditional uh, filmmakers and we cannot go through all those, uh, this journey to make a film. And we did, next film was Khiam that we made with $2,000 just to, <laughs> to see the gap. And, uh, but of course we want to do feature films and we really wanted to make a film about a very personal uh, subject for us. We've been working as artists, we were working for a long time about this notion of latency and latent, f uh, latent uh, uh, presence in the city. Because in Beirut at that time, in the beginning of 2000, you would feel that there is a lot of presence of uh, the war, and some, but really underneath something, it's like. And at the same time, Khalil's uncle, uh, Junior Katane, who was kidnapped during the war in uh, 1985. And so um, his family was asking like, the, qu the, the question that a lot of people ask uh, in that situation, that what should we do now after like uh, 15, 18 years? Should we still wait for him? Uh, and he was like this latent question all the time, this latent absence, presence, um, very uh, strange. And at that moment, they, the family of Khalil decided that uh, they had to, f half of the family decided that they have to finish with this question in a way because it was too difficult for them. And they did something that impressed us, the last Khalil and me, uh, uh, funerals but without a corpse. And they decided that for them, uh, the his daughters decided that he, he had to rest. And, but of course, his mother couldn't. So there was all this. Um, very torn question and um, divided. And at that moment, we were working on this project that is called Latent Images. And Latent Images is, in a way, um, a part of the Wonder Beirut project where Abdullah Farah, the photographer, he takes images, but without revealing them, because it's a practice that Khalil and me, we were doing without really understanding why. But you know, you take a lot of images and then you don't reveal them. And at, at the moment, we thought, like, it's really interesting. Why don't we take images and write them and without revealing them? Because there were so many images and very spectacular images during this war and the after war. Like, we thought about <coughs> sorry, a strategy maybe to put the, the images outside of their uh, uh, natural context and to write them and to make the viewer read them. And so, in a way, to share imagination around image, images. And this is the latent uh, project. Sorry. And then this particular project then led into the context for a perfect day. Yeah, because at the same moment, life gives you always something. We um, found in uh, Khalil's uncle, um, box of images, a latent film. And this film was not developed. He didn't have time to send it to the, uh, to the lab, and so we were very impressed by that fact. And we were kept on saying, should we develop it? Should, shouldn't we develop it? And all the people we asked said, like, there will be nothing left after, like, 20 years. And, but we worked on it, and this is a film you're going to see. This predates Perfect Day. Oh. This is the premise of the film, so.
This is the envelope where we found the film, the latent film. And this is the film. And it was a, a very strange moment because of course the film was uh, white and the images have in a way disappeared. But while working in the film and uh, doing color correction with the labs little by little, you will see what happened. So this idea of the absent image, the latent image, obviously propelled by this particular uh, film which you developed and the, and the project around it, fed into the context of uh, a perfect day. And before we show that, maybe it would just be ideal to have a sense of how you conceptualize those scripts. So do you develop a film script or is it a more intuitive process in terms of how you're working? Because you explained in the beginning that the traditional conventional multi-studio co-production model for you was one that you found rather oppressive. So. Um, yeah, maybe today I'm more ready to find it less oppressive than before, but uh, at that moment, yes. And uh, at that time, we were working on a film, uh, a love story, and uh, we wanted to uh, to work on Khal, uh, Khalil's uncle disappearance because we thought it was really a, a very important subject for Lebanon. We know that there is still 17,000 uh, people missing and we don't know nothing about them. And so uh, uh, at the moment we thought like, why don't we mix uh, both stories? Because we had these films, uh, this th the films that we show showed you uh, just before and we were so impressed by it, we couldn't stop thinking about it. 
And um, we had all this uh, background of uh, Khalil's family and the difficult decision for them. And this is how we wrote Perfect Day. So uh, Perfect Day was a film that we wrote uh, like uh, for months and it was a very difficult film because we, d we want it to happen in one day. And it's a day very important because there's a, a son and his mother. The father disappeared during the war and they it's, it is the day just before the moment where they're going to declare the father dead. And the mother doesn't want to do it, and the son say, like, we should do it. And it's taking place in Beirut, and Beirut is really a, a very important character of the film. And so it was very difficult to write because we wanted it to be uh, not very narrative, but very central and emotional. And uh, so this is how we did The Perfect Day. At the moment where we had to shoot the film, uh, the producer came and said, like, you know, we don't have money, so you have to change all the script. We have 90,000 dollars to make the film. So here we have to be, like, uh, uh, we were uh, thinking, like, we're not changing the script. We've been writing the script for ages, um, but we don't have money to shoot it, so we have to find a solution. And maybe being an artist and uh, in a way uh, used to do things in another way, we decided to work the film as a setup and uh, not to take any, um, for example, uh, you know, extras for the film, but to, uh, and not to reconstitute anything, but to take our actors and to just put them in situations. For example, we had uh, scenes with traffic jams, essential if you live in Beirut, and so we didn't recreate a traffic jam. We thought like, we have traffic jams, why, don't we, why do we have to create them? So let's insert our characters in real traffic jams. Then the same, for example, because there's a part that is during the night, taking place during the night, and so why should we go and fa do fake parties and ask extras to dance? Let's do to real parties or real bars and, uh, and uh, places and just shoot. And uh, of course we had authorization, as you can imagine, and the whole film was made like that. Like, uh, if we want to, do to go to the Corniche, to the seaside, we sh why do sh we sh have to close it? We just put our character sleeping there, as you see in the picture here, and we'll see what happens. Well, this is the way we, we end up producing this film. And it was for us a real uh, revelation. And did it shift the narrative when you were doing this, the responses from the public which were happening? The um, engagement? Yes, because, but not a lot. You know, it's a very strange, I, I experience it after, like you write something, you, put a, you do a setup, you don't give the script to the actors, because usually this is what we did. We begin from this film, we know from Ashes, a short film we did before, not giving the script to the actor. Not of course because we don't trust them, but because we trust that they can give us a lot more than what we wrote. So, um, and, uh, and when something happened in the real life, you just, of course, shoot it, take it. Uh, never, we don't, I don't like to control, so I just like to follow. And this is what happened with Perfect Day. Which clip should we show this soon? Yeah.
So just to uh, explain this uh, relation, um, the in the in Khalil's uncle film that you just saw, um, we felt very strongly uh, that we called uh, lasting images that uh, the images were haunted in a way, and there was like a ghost presence. And we wanted to give this in the film in perfect day. So uh, for Claudia, the mother that you just seen in that scene, it's just she has a feeling that he is still here. And uh, so she has this relation with her hand. Uh, she, she can, in a way, touch him, touch his presence. For her, it's not finished. Uh, he's, uh, he's still there around. And maybe at that moment, the way we were thinking about it, it's like if you don't... Uh, in a way, acknowledge the disappearance. If you know, ac acknowledge the the uh, the ghost, you cannot find a way to end up with all those vi that violence that is uh, around us. Should we show another clip? Yes, in La uh, Haida. I have two questions about this project. One is, how was it moving to this more nimble form of structure? So you went from a million million dollar budget to a two thousand dollar budget in um, ashes, which was followed uh, by Khiam. and then yeah. you come to ninety thousand dollars for this feature film. How did this affect the exhibition and distribution of this particular project? At the end, the film cost uh, the perfect day uh, four hundred thousand. Okay. Because after you have, uh, it was Edition 90 for the, for the production for shoot. For the, just the shooting. Um, it was, a, a perfect day was a very strange experience because the, the budget, the production uh, didn't affect the quality of the film. Like we, uh, we really had the impression that we were doing exactly what we wanted to do and we had this freedom in a way. And, um, the distribution of the film was a real surprise because um, the film went to a Locarno Film Festival in competition. It, uh, uh, it, it had a lot of awards uh, there and after. It was really, a, a we had a very uh, well-known at that moment uh, word seller that was interested in this film and took it and, uh, it, and it was released in several countries. But 
Um, so we were very happy about the film because the production and the distribution were very coherent. So you know, it's when when a film, what is the most important is when you find this coherence between a project and its uh, production and its distribution. One thing I wanted to ask about was the actual artworks that emerge from the project. So these images, for example, are in the collection of the Pompidou. And even if we went back to uh, Wonder Beirut, for example, these are artworks that are in the collection, say, of the Victorian Albert Museum. How do you, uh, this is a question that often comes up in these forums, is how do you work around the issues of copyright of images or projects that may be seen in both contexts? Because obviously in the art context, these images are editioned and distributed with a very particular value uh, around rarity. And uh, cinema is a much more mass distributed context. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Um, yes, and just because I wanted to add, because I didn't really answer your first question, is that um, for me there's no uh, difference if I do a feature film, I do a feature film, if I have to go back to a short film, it's not because I did uh, a feature film that I'm not doing a short film, you know, we did Ashes that is a short film just after doing uh, Around the Pink House that was a feature film, for me it's just uh, the format of the film, it's uh, like uh, 30 minutes, it's like an hour and a half, it's it's a natural format, so the production come with that too. Like uh, there are films that you you really need more money, so you have to find it, and films that you can that really is a script tells you, the story tells you that you don't have to have a lot of pos of money. You have to just go and make it in, in a kind of urgency. And uh, I, for the question of edition. Uh, for example, f uh, films and art are very separate. Like uh, we have a traditional producer to make our fi uh, feature films, and uh, we never sell our feature film our as art work. It's never feature films, and I really insist with Khalil that those films are not shown in museums. They can have screenings some from time to time in museums or institutions that deal with art, but their places is at film festival and in uh, theaters. And this were we we. It's very clear for us. And, uh, and there's no products that are between both, you know? It's just artwork and, uh, and films. And it comes like that, it's a, a research. So we produce images, these pr images led us to produce uh, stories and, you know. And it's often very close to our life. So it's things that are very linked to it. And of course, just for context, that's, I think, for artists, that's relatively unique in so much as you have filmmakers such as Matthew Barney, for example, mm. who his feature films are sold as editioned artworks. To buy a DVD, for example, of one of the Cream Master Cycles would cost you $100,000, for example. So the way that you work across both forms is very different from, say, also other filmmakers such as Pippa Lottie Rist. Um, but uh, it's part of a, a different kind of crossover, as it were. Um, Yes, because, um, for example, I never tried to uh, to produce films uh, uh, in the art world, you know, so like to, to sell, to pre-sell uh, copies of the film. Mm. Uh, if Even if I want to do a lot of uh, interaction between them, it's more thematic or uh, formal research than uh, uh, this kind of uh, interaction. A question that's often asked, asked of me is whether artists galleries or collectors or patrons ever support films? Has that ever happened or has it ever been offered to you in, this p in any of your contexts? Um, yes, but I, don't, I would try not to accept this. I mm. think it's interesting that films has a kind of economy by itself. You see, you, uh, if you find some money, if you find some distribution, it helps you have this coherence that I was talking about. Mm. If not, you are mixing things mm. that are not mixable in a way for me because a film has to be shown everywhere it has to be you know released uh, you have to s could you sell mm. more dvds that you can if it can be on youtube you know mm. i i believe in that uh, sense of sharing uh, films a scenario though say for example a collector said to you i want to give you 40000 euros towards your film i don't want anything i just want uh, my name as executive producer on the film. Would you accept that? Or do you have to think about it? <laughs> uh, 
um, yeah, he, it's di here it's different. It's like private uh, equities or private money. He, like he wants to help a film to happen, but he's not taking an addition. He's not taking mm. anything here. He, he's not taking something from the film. He, is, he doesn't say like in Dubai you will show it just in my house. Mm. You know, no. Okay, I want to be able to show the film in the festival, for example. <laughs> So let's jump to another project which also had a very interesting production process around it. And it's slightly different in that it it's um, there aren't necessarily art objects or materials that have emerged from it, but as a film it's most certainly a piece of art in terms of the way it's shot, the way it's conceptualized. But it also has the biggest star, arguably, of any of your films, and this is Je Peux Voir starring Catherine Deneuve and Rabia Amroui. Can we talk a little bit about this project? Um, yes, the idea of this project um, uh, happened just after the 2006 war in Lebanon. That was a very short and very violent war, a month and a half. And uh, we were very uh, destabilized and uh, desperate after that uh, war because we thought that, okay, maybe we had a lot of problems, but we wouldn't leave something like that. It was a, a war between Israel and uh, Lebanon, very violent, uh, terrible war. And we wanted, we, we asked ourselves, like we were, we were writing a script at that moment and we just couldn't make the film after. We had to do something and we, we were thinking like, what can we do, what kind of images? Because there was uh, images everywhere of that conflict, very, very spectacular images, and it didn't stop anything. It didn't make something happen. So uh, we were like doubting the power of images and thinking like, what can we do now uh, uh, as filmmakers, because this is what we do, we do images, how do we do it? So we went to South Lebanon and um, we tried to take uh, pictures and images and we tried to, to put a tripod on a border and uh, this did a big mess. Everyone came. They wanted to take uh, to take uh, the, the tripod, the camera, and we thought like uh, it's strange. We cannot put a tripod here. So little by little, there was this idea like, what kind of images can we do, and what uh, what can happen? So we can put this tripod on this border, and uh, so we thought about cinema, and we said maybe the answer is cinema, bringing. Uh, a crew bringing a star and uh, make something happen here. And so we asked Catherine Deneuve because we thought like maybe if we bring an icon of films, we could just ask ourselves like what kind of film can we do when the, uh, in a way the, um, the reality is so heavy and uh, that we cannot film it because we cannot see it anymore. We cannot see runes anymore. We, we how can we do to see them again? to feel again the, the terrible weight of images. And so the, uh, the, uh, the idea here is that we, we thought of a very simple setup. This is why, it, in a way, it comes from uh, art for me. So we ask two person, uh, Catherine Deneuve, who's for us, in a way, represent an idea of cinema, a history of cinema, and an actor and performer, a very good artist called Rabia Amroué, that in a way we had a very strong relation with because he was in all our films and we did a lot of, uh, he, he represents the story of our generation in Beirut for us. And we, this two sto history in a way could go together to find a, 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 a moment, a place to say story in a different way. And we write to Catherine Deneuve, of course, Catherine Deneuve, uh, um, it's, uh, she's a star, but we just wrote her like, we need you to do this film, uh, this is what we can offer. And um, so she said she's interested. Of course, we didn't offer her money because, yeah, uh, because yeah, you had it was not the idea. Because you had 50,000 euros yeah. to begin with. Exactly, and the idea was not to uh, send the film uh, and ha have traditional money, but we were in a moment of urgency. We had to shoot very quickly. So this, it's a film without money because this was the idea. Of course, you pay technicians and you get some money, but uh, we couldn't pay her, pay Rabia, pay us. It was, it was an adventure that we were doing together. And this film was shot, as I understand, without a script. 
So there was a script. Uh, there were situations that were scripted, and we were supposed to shot a short film. So uh, what happened is that we went to see Catherine Deneuve, and uh, she said, OK, um, I will do the film. So we said, OK, there's no money. She said, OK. There is no script. She said, OK. And uh, there is no guarantee. We don't uh, want you to, to say, like, we're not going there, we're not going there, we're going everywhere. So she said, OK. And she was really open to everything. But she said, I'll give you six days. So in six days, we, we prepared a kind of short films in situations. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, we shot this six days uh, with a very uh, specific uh, way of doing. It's like we were really following. Uh, Catherine and Verbia didn't have the script, even the minimal script. And uh, we were uh, using the same technique that in Perfect Day. Like we were going to places, shooting there, waiting to see what's happened, like the extracts that you will see at the border. <coughs> and for example, at the end of the film, there's a, a kind of reception. And uh, we, did, we didn't really stage this re reception. We just put our camera in a reception that was existing in Beirut, and we filmed it. And it was very interesting, because a lot of things happened, and we recorded all that. And uh, finally, when we were editing the film, it happened that it was not a short film. It was a feature film, because it was long. It was like an hour and 15 minutes. And here the problems would begin, because of course, Catherine Deneuve, she said OK for a short film without money, but now it's a feature film. And uh, the film is selected in Cannes. So um, we had to go to tell her, like, sorry, but a it's a feature film. It's selected in Cannes. And she said, like, great. And, <laughs> and obviously, bring bringing an icon of cinema to the context obviously created more context, as you suggest. And I remember Khalil saying to me that, for example, the French embassy, you just say, in Beirut, Catherine Deneuve is coming, so a reception becomes formed. And in a sense, the idea of bringing a cinematic icon to the context activated um, the production, the what enabled the production in a sense. Is that right? And we had an idea before that. We wanted to do a film with uh, like an American icon, an actor uh, like Robert De Niro or something like that. What happened when you bring a body of cinema like that in a country like Lebanon or in a region where American politics is a problem? Like so you have cinema and you have politics and you have the way of seeing and so you have this body, this body that is next to you. What happened when you are in a car with him? What happened? So this wa was the idea. When we when the 2006 war happened, we thought like American, is maybe it's not a good idea. This is why I went for a French woman. But there was the same idea that Catherine will come and her iconic presence will do things. So of course the embassy, where, where the French embassy was uh, put, uh, they wanted a bodyguard. So we said, OK, if you want a bodyguard, the bodyguard will be in the film. If you, uh, at moments in borders, like they would say, uh, if you stop the shooting, the, this would be in the film. We were just recording everything you know, as a documentary, but it, it was uh, fiction. And of course, the film, um, it's, uh, it plays with this idea. It's question more than plays this idea of reality and fiction. And how do you bring fiction that is, in a way, uh, cinema and dreaming in places like that. And so everything changed all the time because of the presence of Catherine and the crew. Should we show a clip? Is that the border? Yes, it's the border. The little route there is the one that brings us the closest to Israel. It's a flat statue for the moment. What do you mean? Normally, it's interdict to march there. We had the authorization just for the film. Peut-être parce que vous êtes avec nous. Ça va être proche de chez là. C'est un sentiment bizarre pour moi.
C'est un trou de pluie. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait là It's a, it's a good example of the way we, we did the film because when we are at this border, it's clear that we are repeating this moment where we put a tripod and we couldn't film. Uh, but uh, we don't really know if we're going to be able to film at that moment. So we put the tripod and there is uh, Catherine with us and, uh, and the, the, f the UNIFIL has to talk to Israel and uh, to see if we can take this road that is in Lebanon, okay? So it's not a road that, but it's a road that we can not cross usually. And of course, our idea is, can we open a road? It's a little bit metaphorical, but it's the idea that like films, cinema, maybe can open a road uh, uh, and that is close, that we as Lebanese, we cannot have access to this part of Lebanon. And uh, so Catherine is here, we're waiting, 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 we're filming. And at a moment, the uh, Unifil chief comes and he's a big fan of Catherine. And he said like, okay, maybe we can open this, but I want a picture with her. So we go to Catherine, okay, you take a picture with him and it's in the film. So we take a picture and they open the road like for a moment, but it's so incredible that we couldn't open this road before. And of course, while they are walking, they cannot really take this road because there is a hole that, because the road was bombarded. And, um, but it's a moment where you, cinema can open something very strangely closed. So let's jump to your most recent pr feature film project, Lebanese Rocket Society, which began as research which began as art, which began as a number of different things, and I certainly was aware of it more as an art project when I got to be aware of it. W should we start by showing a trailer, or where yes, would you let's, let's start with showing it. Let's do it. In the beginning, we saw the image of a rocket, a rocket sporting the colors of the Lebanese flag. It's hard to believe. Yet at the very beginning of the 60s, a small group of students from Haigazian University, headed by Professor Manouk Banougian, launched the first rocket of the Arab world. This is the very beginning. I looked at my students and said, OK, we're going to start from scratch. At that point, we said, OK, now we can look at larger rockets. The world in those years is a world of possibilities. The students of Haigazian, army mechanics, engineers, it becomes a collective effort. Here's this tiny country of Lebanon in this huge part of the Middle East that was inducting such experiments that no other country at the time was able to do it. So it became part of the history of Lebanon. And at that point, we decided to call it the Lebanese Rocket Society. So this project is uh, what you might call a multi-platform, multi-form project with six elements. The feature film being one element of many, and it's uh, seven elements. Seven yeah. elements, mm. and it's uh, it's an interesting case study because uh, for numerous reasons, but also because I think other artists also um, have adopted this. And actually, last year we were talking about a picture pong where Stucco's primitive project, for example, which involved about roughly six similar elements. And what was very interesting talking and digging into that project was that. In that context, the art project was the research um, that gave birth to the film. But here, in a sense, it's slightly different in so much as that the all of the different components are layered on top of each other. And maybe we can start to talk about the genesis of this project, the research, and how it all came together. It's a project that began in uh, 2001 because my sister uh, was told me about the space project that was in Lebanon, but um, it was very strange, so we couldn't really believe her, like a space project in Lebanon, something serious. And um, she showed me, or I, I found after uh, a stamp, a very strange stamp showing 
like uh, edited in 1964 and uh, showing uh, a kind of rocket going to the, to the star, the moon. So this was very strange. We did some research and then it was very difficult to find any elements in Beirut. So we stopped a little bit the project and we did other stuff as, as you've seen. And then finally, after Je veux voir, we thought like, we need something like, uh, like we say like, uh, we need something like more positive uh, in our life at that moment. And uh, we just started to rethink about this project of rocket. And what was very interesting to us, of course, all the story of this uh, uh, rocket society, but also like how a project like that, if it was serious, and it's, it was a serious project because they launched more than 10 rockets and uh, they really, it, it, it went bigger and bigger. One of it uh, went to Cyprus. So it was really a very interesting and serious project, how it just disappeared from our imaginary. And what does it mean? And we are always very interested, Khalil and me, in representation and construction of imaginaries and all that. And writing of history, this is in a way a little bit our, our concerns. So we, were, we decided to make a film. And we were going to do a traditional documentary. And uh, the first part of the film is like that. It's a, a traditional documentary where we started, we, we did a lot of research. We find everyone, uh, everyone still alive from the Lebanese Rocket Society. We went to Tampa, we went to, uh, to New York. We, we traveled all over the world to, uh, to, to find them and to, uh, to some of them were in Beirut, but some of them had left, and to find many, a lot of materials and uh, many archives and uh, all the films that uh, you, you see in the film uh, were uh, in Tampa. We couldn't find in Beirut, but Manouk Manoukian, the founder of the project, had all that. And while we were doing this uh, research, we had an invitation um, from the Sharja Biennale to do something. And uh, we were thinking, like, what can we do? We are working on those rockets. And um, at that moment, we thought, like, uh, we find this, uh, um, this is a picture of the album of the president that we did. But I think you, you want to show this. So um, at the moment, we thought, like, if this project uh, vanished totally from our history and our imagination, let's give it a physical trace, a materiality. So we decided. Uh, to present um, in Sharjah a rocket and to bring this rocket um, uh, to and to offer this rocket to the University High Gazian where this project begins. And so we build the rocket. Of course, it's very difficult to build a rocket in Beirut. Uh, it's very difficult to, of course, uh, send it to Sharjah. This I think the <laughs> Sharjah team can talk about. But um, the idea was like, in the 60s, this r those rockets would go from Haigazian University in Hamra and will cross to Dubai, uh, to Dubai, yeah, sorry, to go uh, to be sent uh, over the sea. And then the, the factory where bu we built this rocket was in Baye. So we had this idea like we want to bring back the rocket as it was supposed to go before, so on a truck. Uh, and to film this, to see what's happening if we put a rocket on a truck in Beirut today. Because the most important thing it was to say, like, this is not a military project. This was really a scientific project, a space project that we did. And how the, our imaginary is constructed to see it today as a military project while it was a scientific project and a space uh, that projects that a bunch of dreamers uh, did in a university in the 60s. So, and this finally, we thought like, it impossible, it has to be part of the film. So all the construction of the rockets, uh, the authorization uh, happened to become the second part of the film. So this story about this group of dreamers who there was that disappeared during the end of the, the, the crushing of, your, as it were, the Pan-Arab ideal, what you did here was you reenacted or a historical event by looking at the iconography of a rocket. It started as a commission for Sharjah, and then the actual process of moving this becomes a scene in the film. But that's not the only time that this happened, because actually the entire film 
is laced with these kind of pieces of research or these incidents that end up making it up into the narrative itself. Where should we go next, President? We were, in a way, overwhelmed. Like, we found things, uh, and we didn't want to be nostalgic at all in this film, because there was a kind of possibility to say, ah, look, uh, when can now and so now, look where we were in the 60s and where we are today, and this I really didn't want to do at all. So the idea was to reactivate past in the present. So you reactivate by doing this uh, reactivation of the rocket through the street of Beirut today. Or you reactivate by the, the project of the president's album that was the first, uh, because for a very long time we didn't have any images of the project before we go to Tampa and we find everything there. But so at that moment, the only thing that we had was this, uh, some images, but especially this album that was uh, an album uh, that uh, the Rocket Society did for President Chab in 1963. And then when uh, the president died, his wife gave it back to General Wahbi, that was one of the uh, members of the Lebanese Rocket Society. And when we went to General Wahbi, he gave us this uh, album. And this is the album that we took of Cedar Tree uh, to do the rocket uh, that we launched in Sharjah and in High Gazian University. Uh, so this was very strong for us to have only those pictures. And so we decided to, uh, to make a kind of uh, um, installation where we, we will take the rocket that we reconstituted to repaint it as it is today. Um, it was, sorry, in the 60s. And then to put each page of the album underneath it and then to fold all that and to fold it in a way where will give you the sensation that the whole story is always contained somewhere, but to find it, you have to unfold it. So there's only part of it, but in each uh, strip that you see here, you have the whole eight meter rocket and all the president album, but you have yourself to do the effort, so to bring all the project to, li to life again. And um, for us, of course, uh, fold all that was a nightmare, but it was uh, very, very interesting as uh, conceptually to do that. And the first part that you saw, the rocket going into uh, the, the, the it, it's the beginning of the film. So, so all the, this rocket that we built was the beginning of the film. And um, this is the next, uh, let's talk about the uh, stage. Oh, we have to golden rocket. This is uh, another experimentation that we did related to the presence of the rocket in the streets of Beirut and how it gives you a very strange sensation. But while we were doing this research, we did this project too. The Golden Record. That is called the Golden Record because, you know, you go got into research, so you got into space things, and we discovered that... <laughs> made uh, in the, um, in the uh, 70s um, by Americans. And uh, the golden record so was sounds from the earth and some images that were printed on a, on, a, on a record that was sent um, in for possible extraterrestrial uh, presence. So the golden record is in a capsule, a space capsule, and uh, still trying to find a uh, correspondence, like a, but an, a bottle uh, that is thrown in the space. And so we liked very much this idea. And we tried to see what is contained in this um, record. And we saw that there was a lot of very present, uh, Arab presence. Not of, uh, it was very specific to some uh, sounds um, and some music of a specific moments and specific places. So we decided that it, it, um, it would be interesting to create our golden record. And uh, <coughs> so this is what we did. <laughs>
communities, and they're part well, of the memories of the uh, people from the Lebanese rocket societies. And uh, so for us, it was golden record of the 60s and the way we imagine it. And um, so, voila. And so all of these different elements, you make this feature film, it begins like a documentary, and these art projects start to actually form the narrative of this motion picture. And then at the end, we get to this propositional sphere, which is the animation, where in a sense, almost all of this research, all of these installations come and are portrayed in this project. Can we talk a bit about this? Um, the idea with this artworks and, um, and this film, like, was to see how uh, there, there could be um, a mix between, in a way, a documentary and then an artwork that would come into the documentary at a moment and where it could take, take us. And so, in a way, there is a past and there is a present with this rocket. And something was missing, too. Um, when we began doing the film, so we didn't have images. So we decided that it would be great to do uh, animation with some of the photographies that we had. And we called an artist called Hassan Halwani, that is a very good uh, artist. And we asked him to draw for us, like, films, taking, uh, we go from a picture and then we will do a film after. So we begin working like that. And then we will go to Tampa and we find everything at Manouk. So we need to do an animation. But we thought about the fact that it's strange. We don't have a lot of images, of, uh, of uh, science fiction images in, the, in our region. We don't produce a lot of those images. We don't, it's not part of our imaginary. So why don't we produce images like that in animation? That would be the third part, the part around a uh, kind of future, strange future. Imagine um, if we didn't have stopped the space project, because all of pe the people we met, they would all say, imagine if the space project didn't stop. Like, what could happen? And I don't know what could happen. So we thought about going through uh, but this question in an animation, but it's not an animation that we'd we would do today, but we would do from this point of view of the 60s and the fact that the space project well was could well would continue today. لإكمال مهمة بوياجر 1 التي تم إرساله منذ عشرات السنين في مهمة استطلاعية مسافرا بسرعة 17 كيلومترا في الثانية بالنسبة للشمس وحاملا على متنه رسالة رمزية من البشرية بوياجر 1 هو أول قمر يمر بمحاذاة نجم كوني سيتوقف هذا القمر عن العمل بسبب افتقاره للطاقة عند هذه النقطة تنتهي رحلة فوياجر 1 لتبدأ رحلة الأقمار الصناعية الأخرى ستحاول هذه الأقمار جمع عدد وافر من المعلومات عن الفضاء الخارجي كما ستبعث برسائل على شكل صور وأصوات عن كوكب الأرض كل هذه المعلومات مسجلة على أقراص ذهبية جولدن راكر لملاقات الآخر في الفضاء البيفلكي لبنان سيرسل القمر الفضائي أدونيس الذي يحمل ألوان العالم اللبناني ليطلق مع باقي الأقمار الصناعية لاستكشاف الفضاء الخارجي وملاقات المطلق القمر الصناعي أدونيس يحمل صورا وأصواتا من لبنان بعيدا وعاليا كرسالة سلام وتحرر وبالمناسبة سأقتبس كلاما للرئيس جيمي كارتر بمناسبة إطلاق فويرجر 1 لنرسله إلى سكان الكواكب الأخرى ونقول لهم 
هذا هو حاضر بلد صغير وبعيد هذه هي أصواتنا هذه هي صورنا هذا هو تاريخنا وأفكارنا وأحاسيسنا سنحاول أن نتعايش مع زمننا حتى نستطيع العيش في زمنكم In accordance with our instructions, we continued toward the planet which its inhabitants called the Earth in order to study their mode of life. The intelligent creatures on this planet call themselves human beings, and they exist in an amazing variety of conditions. So, as we see, the, el the different elements start to merge back and forth and jump back and forth between a physical installation and within the actual film. I want to ask, uh, before we open to questions very soon, um, just about the production of this pr process, because obviously these scenes, these works that are staged, so for example, the rocket that ends up being in Sharjah is paid for by, I assume, the foundation in terms of the commissioning. So in that respect, could you argue that the film, in a sense, is a co-production between the world of art and cinema in that respect? Um, yes, but uh, not uh, really financially because uh, in a way we had to produce another rocket for the film. So yeah, but I, I wouldn't separate in this case. I would do it like it's for me as a rocket society is a whole project. It's a project where the film is, the pro is one part and the rest is another part, but it's not separate like the rest. So financially too, it's difficult to say like the golden record end up to be here, but uh, uh, it, it was produced by uh, another Biennale, so yes, there is a mix here, but uh, a mix that uh, for me was interesting to explore in that way. Mm. And in terms of the exhibition of the project, the film was obviously distributed um, uh, through um, different distributors in the UK by Soda Pictures, and one of the things that I was wondering is how the exhibitions or elements of the art practice alongside the film, how did that work? Because there were moments, for example, where elements of the work, the Rocket Project, were exhibited mm. while the film was on release. So one of these projects um, that we see here is um, was exhibited at Freeze London during the time that this film was on release. And how did that did that create a meaningful conversation for you in terms of how an audience might be able to engage with the full spectrum of the project? But in, a, in an ideal world, of course, what we really wanted and uh, we tried a lot was the film released and an exhibition at the same time. But it didn't work so well. Like, Of course, a lot of people saw uh, the artwork, and uh, so the, the images and the films, but uh, the temporality were not so easy to mix. Mm. It, it worked in some countries, but uh, I would really have loved, like, the film is released, there is an exhibition, people can go and see both, but the temporality of, uh, temporality of art and films are not totally the same. And the coordination is not... Uh, very easy between the world of art and the world of film. There's a real separation. So it's not the same actors, it's not the same players. So it was really hard, but we I really wanted that with Khalid. This, this was our aim, to say this is a research, this is a project, it goes together, film is part of it, and art is part of the film, and how to do something like an experiment, it, and not to separate. I mean, of, of course, you're raising a very important concern, which is that very often artists that I know who work with cinema in a mainstream level would love ideally to be able to uh, have an exhibition at the same time as if the feature film being released, because not only does it work in terms of um, formally, in terms of thinking about how the narrative can be stretched and expanded, but also from a very pure marketing and audience perspective to be able to galvanize those two things. but. Do you think it's possible because with your next project that you're working on, there is again uh, a link between art and cinema. Do you think that those temporalities could at all shift so that museums and film producers and distributors could work together in a network to be able to enable a structure whereby you have a big museum show with a project plus the film on wide release, for example? 
Yeah, I would love to. This is something that we are working on, and we will keep working on that because we think it's really an important thing to fight for, in a way. Not to take money from the art world to do films. This is not what I say, because this is not what I've been doing, and I w I'll try not to do that. And not to take, for example, a film that is made from a, uh, as a feature film, a fiction, and put it in a museum. It's not the idea. The idea is that to work all together to make something that can be uh, shown in the same time or in resonance. Towards that aim, um, that note, I think we should open up now if there's any questions about any of the questions raised today in terms of the production, context, exhibition, or the arts. We have a question here. With the microphone just there. Thank you. Okay, I uh, love your work, everyone. Thank you. Every one of it. What super effort will it take from you to have those go together. I mean, what 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 is it that you have to touch in order to have the exhibition go along with the with the with the film? Thank you. The in a pro, it depends of the project. Like I didn't try to do it in other projects at the same way that we did it for the Lebanese Rocket Society because for us it was really an an, an ensemble of things. It was really the same work. I don't know how to express this. It was the same research and the same work. For me, the film, you of course, you can see the film alone and the artwork alone, it stands by itself. But altogether, it would be really very rich <laughs> for us. Do you have any more D over here? So can we uh, get the when I saw the, ar the artwork before, I didn't, under I didn't grasp the concept. Like after one year ago, I remember they did, the, they screened the film here in the UAE. And when I saw it, I really, uh, I could understand fully. So it's very important in this case to have them in parallel. It would be great for the, uh, for the audience to really grasp the concept and understand the meaning behind it. Thank you, it's your work is uh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question here in the front. Microphone to your left. I have the feeling that um, it's very important that you work about your life, your home, your home country where you were born, etc. Um, do you think that you could do the same intensity of work if you politically would not be able to go home again? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's an experience when you. Uh, I think that uh, it's a, a kind of impossible answer because I don't have this possibility to go back. Uh, I have this possibility to go back uh, and to go out of the country. So, But uh, I th of course you question yourself as an artist as a, and a filmmaker, like what if I do something out of the region? Whether and uh, in a way, uh, I think that we always believed, Khalil and me, that our territory is not a regional one, but it's more a territory of art and films that we share in places like here in festivals or in, in museums. Or and For example, I, I always think that I, I don't want to be part of uh, just a region, or you see? And, uh, and so to do that, you have to project yourself and to see, and what if I do a work in another country, what happened? And now the last uh, work that we've been working, and uh, Omar uh, uh, was a co-curator of uh, a show that will, that will happen uh, at um, home in Manchester. It's about uh, scams and uh, spams, all the materials that you get from internet. And so internet, it's in a way a very virtual territory. And so it's in we try to work around that concept too. I don't know if I answer your question, but... <laughs> I mean, just to comment on that, I do think that one thing that you do do is even if you don't have the full context, so for example, with latent images, with Je veux voir, what is not visible, what is not seen becomes inspiration or an activation for something else. So I do think that within the work there is this idea of how one can work without an image. And I think this is why it's interesting to think of this blurring between art and cinema, because cinema is a purely imagistic, um, it's a space purely for images, and in a way that relationship between the two allows you to experiment 
um, across forms in a way that it wouldn't be possible if you're working in a singular fashion, as it were. Um, yeah, cinema is a place of uh, invisibility to yeah. the visible and the invisible. And I always had the feeling that the more you are specific, the more you open to to a universal. There's a question in the back there. Oh, thanks. I've been jumping out of my seat to ask you like a million questions halfway through. Um, so if I stumble, please forgive me because your answer is so important for me. <coughs> um, as you talk about the weight of your images and political unrest that's happened uh, unexpectedly, things you wouldn't expect to happen, and it does anyway, and you keep working as an artist and a filmmaker. And I have uh, uh, two questions. The first is as a human being, how do you feel like you keep your center, your, uh, uh, your sense, you, you have to conceive, you have your conceptual center as an artist and as a filmmaker. Um, how do you keep your trajectory in place with all of the overwhelming things that are happening around you? And related to that, do you hope at all um, to have some impact, or what is the hope if you have one, in terms of impact on people who will see your work, whether it's the art or the film? What connection do you hope to keep or to have with your community? And I'm listening and I'm engaged and I think it's a very, uh, you know, it's engaging intellectually in many ways, but I'm thinking about young people that come and, and because you seem so about your work that I know you must have thought of this. I'm wondering like young people and teenagers who may not understand about the ideas yet of representation and uh, cross-pollination and intertextuality and all of these things yet, what impact do you hope to have with them, if at all, for now or even in the future? You know, it's very difficult to think about an audience, generally, you see, it's an, a general audience. Uh, the filmmaker uh, uh, Bresson used to say, like, I think about a spectator. So from the beginning, the first installation we made that was, uh, that is called the circle of confusion, um, that was um, an image of Beirut, uh, an aerial image of Beirut cut in 3,000 pieces and stuck on a mirror and uh, the audience is invited to take part of this project. I think the message for us is very clear. Um, the, the way we work is not to express only our feelings or our thoughts or our conceptual way to see, but it's uh, ev and even if it's always very close to what Khalil and me, we live, and I work with the person that I, my partner that I live because we want to share this. We really want to share it with others. So this is the idea of uh, people taking part of, uh, of an image or postcards that pe people usually can take to, or a film where usually we try to um, to keep a lot of space for the viewer. I don't answer everything. I don't close the end. I, I try. Because I think that all those questions we want to share, we don't have the answers, we don't have a message, but we, it's always questions that make us anxious. So these anxieties we show that we can share. And for a young audience, um, it depends. I'm sure that some of the work are more accessible than others, but you would be surprised, like, uh, it's not the ones that we think. It's, uh, and I always uh, like to, uh, to teach. I teach uh, uh, a lot in universities and uh, art schools, and uh, try to help to build the school of uh, homework uh, space, because I really have the feeling that this is the most important uh, possibility of sharing, not because I have something to give, but we have something to find together. I think the word intertextuality is really key and useful here because what having these two practices enables is a jumping forth and an experimentation with audience uh, expectation as well. And obviously cinema as a form is, uh, of course, more didactic in so much as the networks of circulation and distribution are much more tied to 
an economic impetus. So one of the things that you know we talk about when this film was released in Britain is you know how do we get people to see this film? Increasingly, the market is shrinking uh, for the space uh, of cinema, especially independent films, films that aren't backed by major studios. How many weeks can we keep this on screens in Britain? How do you create and generate the buzz around it when there's no print and advertising budget around these projects? And in a way, what the art does is it allows an, another layer of texture to function, which can, I think, enable a buzz to develop around a project and to keep it in theaters. And I think that was one particular thing that I thought worked really well with London was the screenings at Art House Cinemas, the relationship between art and cinema was very much evidenced through the conversations that were staged around the screenings, which enabled it to build an audience in a way that your average independent film wouldn't be able to. So that's just an observation around about this idea of intertextuality and also the idea of the audience, the blurring of audience between those two spaces. Um. But it's a little bit like you said, you see, uh, for example, a lot of people went to see the artwork and saw the film after or the reverse and they get another sense of it. And uh, so, and I think, for example, maybe the film is uh, in a way more accessible to, to f understand the whole story because it gives you the whole narratives. But I think you can find it in another way in the artwork. It's we have time for one more question before we close. We have uh, just here. Thank you. I also, I really like your work and kind of, it seems that every project came from an idea that was sort of, I wouldn't say spontaneous, but you came upon it. You mentioned that life gives you things and something else that made me wonder, how do you view uh, an event or a piece of information that comes into your life and see it as you know, your next work? Where does that intuition come from? And how, um, how do you view these sort of coincidences in your life as an artist? Um, I really follow them in a way because um, I, you know, I, I work with someone else. So we work together, we live together, we fight a lot, we have a lot of discussion, and we, we ev always argue on our next project. And, but we're not at all strategic in a way in the production or we should do a film like that or this is a good subject. Or even if we sometimes we try to do it, we always fail to, to, to succeed in doing something like that. But what we, 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 because we are very obsessional, both of us, especially me, we, we, if when something happened to us, we keep on thinking about it. And uh, this small fact can uh, meet a conceptual research that we're doing, or a formal research. For example, we did a film called The Lost Film, uh, because one day we received an email, um, and uh, this email was saying that uh, one of the copy of the Pink House was uh, disappeared in Yemen, and this was very strange for us. Like Yemen copy, why disappeared? And so uh, we we was thinking about it, and we thought like this is really interesting because we keep on asking ourselves what is our statue of, as our filmmaker, what kind of image ca images can we do? So let's go to Yemen and find something there. And this is the way. This is a very good example of the way we work and we do our films too. So um, why do we decide to go to Yemen? Because at the moment it's like your germ and it's something in your mind like is. What if, and the what if takes you somewhere, and, and you don't really know where you're going, but this is the pleasure of it, in a way, because you know that there are places where you won't go, because you know that this is not your interest, or this kind of images you're against, you won't do. So at the moment, you've, you're okay to let go, and not to control everything, and life gives you very interesting stuff that can mix with more conceptual or artistic, uh, uh, you know, thoughts. Thank you. Okay, so that's all we have time for. Thank you all so much for attending this Thank Screaming you very Images much. session. And thank you to Joanna Hajitoma. Thank you, Omar. <laughs>